Um, and welcome, Terry. Terry McAllister is a co-author along with James Marriott, uh, and he's going to introduce the new book, Crude Britannia, How Oil Shaped a Nation. So Terry is planning to speak for maybe 20 minutes, and then uh, we're hoping to get a, a, a lively discussion. Um, as I say, uh, Lighthouse have organized a special offer on copies of the book, and you'll find the details in the chat. Um, Terry's introduction will be recorded and published on the, the website. Uh, just to set off, I, I read the book when it came out and thoroughly enjoyed it. It's thought provoking and it shines a very welcome light from a, a, an interesting angle on uh, an industry that to my mind has worked hard with some success to control their image in the face of the death and destruction they spread around the globe. Anyway, um, Gary, thanks for taking this time to speak to us. Uh, the floor is yours. Um, <clears throat> thanks very much, Neil. Thanks very much, Pete. Um, Scott E3 and Lighthouse, uh, and everyone who's turned up this evening, uh, welcome, and I appreciate your interest in the book and the subject matter. Um, I'm, I'm, I think Scott E3 particularly, <laughs> Uh, the material that you've got on the website um, and the kind of debate and uh, discussion that has been gendered by it is really, really interesting. Very clear material. I really like the way you um, produce these kind of very short bulletins. Very good. And I share your commitment to um, the energy transition, but equally social justice, bringing on board trade unionists and oil workers, as well as climate activists. So yes, I'm Terry, I'm a co-author of Crude Britannia, which was published by Pluto Press in May with James Marriott was my um, co-conspirator. James is a campaigner with the Platform Collective whose work you can find at least one of their interesting documents on um, the Scotty Three website. And he's a co-author of three other books. Um, one of them was called The Oil Road. So, <clears throat> I'm a, I'm a freelance journalist. Uh, I worked for The Guardian for 20 years. I was the energy editor there. I was the industrial correspondent. Um, and I'd worked on a variety of national papers. Um, I also, I've been a journalist all my life. I'm a life member of the National Union of Journalists. I'm a former Labour councillor in Hackney. And I first started writing about oil and industry um, four decades ago. So I've been around the track rather probably too long, but enough to uh, give me a kind of insight into exactly what Neil was mentioning just there around um, the oil industry is very opaque, is very hard. It likes to be hidden. It doesn't like scrutiny. And so um, it helps if you've been around it a long time to <laughs> to work out how to get inside it. We actually thought this book, when we originally set about doing it, we thought it would probably take about 18 months or 24 months at the most. It took us five years. Um, so it was it, it was much grander project than we actually um, envisaged. Um, as Neil also said, the strap line of the book is how oil shaped a nation. And what we were trying to do with that was explore how oil had influenced the politics, the economics, and also the popular culture of Britain. Um, equally, conversely, we wanted to show how Britain had changed in the period between the Second World War and where we are now. And we wanted to use oil as a kind of lens to track those social political changes. So Crew Britannia is a journey, it's a kind of intellectual journey. We were trying to understand um, how the industry worked and what impact it had had. And I guess at the beginning, we had this idea that the, the, the oil was potentially the, the um, tail that wagged the dog, that it was so powerful and that power had, had been completely underestimated 
um, both by politicians and, um, but more particularly by uh, the public. And we wanted to show how that was happening. Um, we also, it was also, or it is also a physical journey. So James and I spent a lot of time, ironically, I guess, in a, in a petrol driven hire cars and things wherever we, we got to by train. Um, driving around um, and we looked at four particular regions, Northeast Scotland was one of them, uh, Merseyside, um, South Wales and the Thames Estuary and we wanted to see how uh, local communities had benefited, lost out or changed as a result of oil being around and also uh, with oil losing its primacy um, and renewables uh, taking off to some extent, how that had influenced what was going on in local communities. So we tracked down senior politicians, um, but also corporate bosses like Ben Van Burden, the boss of Shell. We went to The Hague um, to interview him and we visited super secretive oil traders in the Surrey, in their posh houses in the Surrey Hills. Uh, we talked to reformer um, technicians, refinery workers, trade unionists, as well as renewable power entrepreneurs, climate activists, uh, musicians and filmmakers. And um, on the subject of filmmakers, we've been helping um, some Scottish filmmakers led by um, Emma Davey, um, a film director in Edinburgh, make a documentary for the BBC called The Black Black Oil. That's the title at the moment. It will be broadcast on BBC One next month, meant to be October the, 20, October the 26th, I think. Um, and they are also going to produce a longer film, which we hope uh, we'll be able to play in cinemas and, and arts picture houses and trade union movement and meetings and XR events and all that kind of thing. Um, the other thing about the book is it's got a soundtrack to it, which probably makes it rather unusual, which I think you can find on Spotify. Um, and we both like popular music, but we were interested to see the way the oil industry had kind of seeped in or was reflected by popular culture. And once you start looking, it's, it's remarkable how much this kind of um, springs out. You can also, in other uh, forms of culture and literature, you can find um, books around the influence of oil or cars, which is obviously very much caught up with car culture and, and oil, like Crash by J.G. Ballard, Autogeddon by Heathcote Williams. Um, but this is not a sort of heavy book at all. I mean, it's deliberately written with a light touch. We've written some, a number of people who've reviewed it have said it's, it's a bit like a kind of detective novel. And so um, I'll read you a little section very quickly um, in a minute and you'll get a kind of flavour for the, how we approached it. So we kind of go on this physical journey that I talked about and um, we kind of talk to all the characters, but it, it's the target audience as I say, it was not an academic one or we weren't trying to impress anyone. What we really wanted to do was provide something in the way of a, a kind of social history, um, a travel log, and, and arguably in a perfect world, a sort of climate activist handbook, because it would really show you a deep insight into, um, into this oil industry, which if I look out of my skylight just up there and down the road, I can see a shell garage and like you, there's, there's these very visible signs of the oil industry. But that's kind of in contrast with what we mentioned earlier about the way the oil industry likes to be um, unseen. It's hidden in plain sight. It certainly doesn't like to be seen influencing government. And while many industries that I've covered, lots of different industry in my journalistic career, um, hire these kind of big name public relations firms in the city who do their, their dark arts on the behalf of the particular industry, the oil industry, uh, we will try and show in this book actually doesn't even bother with that because it's so enmeshed, it's so close 
to the political process there's a wafer thin gap between UK government foreign policy say and the needs of oil and gas companies um, Britain's colonial involvement in Nigeria, Trinidad, Kuwait and places like this attest to that. Equally, obviously, Iran and Iraq were always considered part of Britain's sphere of influence, part of the informal empire. So, you know, it was the invasion of Iraq a war for oil? Much asked, much denied. Uh, well, there was certainly no talk of Western countries uh, liberating other dictatorships or stated dictatorships, such as Zimbabwe. So we also show that the North Sea oil, um, that was an offshore colony effectively used in the same way, um, not in a sort of, a sort of racist element to colonial policy in the global south, but certainly in terms of being used as a laboratory, and actually there is, a, again, there's a lovely um, document on, on you know, the E3 website about uh, neoliberalism and the North Sea, and certainly this is something we look at the way um, privatisation uh, by the Thatcher government was very much sort of triggered by BP pushing to remove the state element of its ownership. And uh, the North Sea was developed um, as far as possible without trade unions. Um, it certainly played an important role in the miners' strike, um, providing fuel when uh, Thatcher was trying to break the um, heavy um, industrial power of the National Union of Mine Workers. Uh, we also look, uh, which is part of our uh, looking at regional areas, the way deindustrialization, which has been much marked and remarked on, um, and there's a whole raft of fantastic books out at the moment about coal deindustrialization. Um, and you can read about the deindustrialization of the coal industry or the steel industry or the car industry. Um, but oil has never really been um, reviewed in that light. And in fact, it, it's, um, the more you look into it, the more you realize it um, played just as influential, as influential a role um, in areas like South Wales, which used to have enormous petrochemical complexes and import terminals. There's barely anything there. Equally on the Thames estuary, um, you can see the same thing. It used to have a, a massive uh, petrochemical complex as big as anything in Rotterdam. And now it's, it's completely removed. And it's no surprise to us that you see the biggest uh, Brexit vote in, um, in that area of Essex. So, we also look at the way there's a lot of concentration on the big oil companies, rightly, who played such a sort of important role in the development and the arguably manipulation of the whole process that we're, we're looking at here. But they have been hugely in retreat. And part of that is, is the deindustrialization. We see the way they came and we see the way they left, but they did so. Um, carefully and as far as possible outside the glare of, of um, media scrutiny. Um, but their role, their selling off of assets, and they remain targets, um, understandably, um, for climate activists like the XR. But, you know, they are where they are divesting assets and uh, promising to... Um, greenify their operations. They're often selling on these assets, particularly say in the North Sea, to um, a new breed of private equity and foreign state-owned companies who are much less accountable um, to either uh, through annual general meetings of shareholders. It's very hard for the public or, or climate activists to get at them. So you see with Cambo, say, which has hit the headlines through its connections with Shell, but the major um, owner there is Sicker Point Energy. I mean, who, who knows who Sicker Point Energy is? Not, not many people. So 
I talked earlier about the, the closeness with government, the fact that there was a wafer thin kind of gap between uh, what oil and gas companies wanted and how foreign policy was developed by the British government. Um, but this is also a part of the famous revolving door, which we hear about um, where business and government have this very, very close relationship. And most recently, we've heard a lot about, um, well, there's investigations going on into the activities of the Cameron government and him bringing in um, completely unaccountable financiers like Lex Greensill. But actually, if you look at history, um, they weren't uh, brought in outside of civil service um, uh, interviews, etc. But you see this massive flow that started with oil executives and particularly with Lord Brown, um, the most high profile former chief executive of BP, who was brought into cabinet as lead non-executive director in, 20, in 2010. And this was billed at the time as a way of making government and the civil service more efficient, more business-like, but it also put carbon at the top table of policy making. And it's not long before um, Lord Brown's former head of refining, John Manzoni, followed him and he became chief executive of the civil service. Many other BP executives also went into government. Tony Meggs, who runs the infrastructure um, commission for the government, Vivian Cox, another BP executive was brought in. And in the opposite direction, you see people like um, former defense secretary, Lord Robertson, uh, now acts as a consultant to BP, while the former um, ex-head of MI6, uh, John Sawyers, is on the BP board. Former defence advisor to the Prime Minister, Sir Nigel Scheinwald, has been on the Shell board for 10 years. And many of today's senior politicians worked for oil companies in the past, Liz Truss. Uh, former Secretary of State for International Trade, just been made Foreign Secretary, worked for Shell, as did former Minister of State for Europe, Alan Duncan. Former Lib Dem leader, Vince Cable MP, was a Chief Economist at Shell. Our ex-Armed Forces Minister, Lord Robatham, worked for BP. Chatham House, the most esteemed international advisor, uh, affairs think tank, is full of oil men acting as senior advisors. The point we make in the book is that this cocktail mix of government and fossil fuels um, threatens to allow big oil to set the parameters of energy policy. Um, Britain has reduced its carbon emissions in recent years, that's got to be acknowledged. But this has largely been done by outsourcing manufacturing to China and by closing down coal-fired generating plants rather than touching the North Sea oil or gas. Equally, you can see BP Shell pushing carbon capture plants so that the oil can keep flowing and that natural gas can be used for hydrogen and other alternative fuels. And we show in the book um, how the big oil men endlessly in their face-to-face -face meetings when they end up in government um, play down endlessly the potential of uh, renewable energy projects. And we talked to Mark Thorock, uh, Shorrock, who um, tried to set up the Swansea Bay Tidal Lagoon, who found himself, and, and we detail this with his meetings with various ex-oil people who are now in government, how difficult it was for him to get any traction with them. Um, so this is a, a book about oil, it's about people, and it's about place. And what conclusions do we come to about the future? Well, clearly we and nature are very badly served by the current phase of high octane capitalism and the environmental degradation and inequality that it produces. We think new forms of ownership, democratic, governmental and community based are needed inside the energy system to make sure it works for our future and not immediate profit. Oil is on the defensive, big oil. Indeed, the International Agency, uh, Energy Agency declared recently that it was time to stop drilling. 
But companies and governments with vested interests and oil coursing through their veins won't go down without a fight. So it's important to understand our own personal oil addictions, the existing power structures, and how they're interwoven with government if we're to move on from a fossilized world. So we're hoping, as I said earlier, that Crew Britannia um, is a social and arguably a trade union history, a travel log, but almost also a climate action handbook that'll help you understand the industry that you're dealing with. So thank you. That's um, a bit about the book. And if you will bear with me, I'll just read you uh, very briefly something from the book that um, might just give you a, a sort of added flavour for how we've written it and, and hopefully um, whet, your, <laughs> whet your appetite for it. So this was um, 24th of September, 2018. What's that? That must be it. We're 30 miles north of Aberdeen, following the coast as closely as we can. Over the treetops, we spy our prey, the tall orange flare of the St. Virgus gas terminal. We turn off the A90 and follow the slip road into the complex. There's no sign of the arteries of energy flowing underground. About a quarter of the UK's gas is running through steel tubes close to the road, pumped away to the generators, kitchens and central heating systems of the nation. We glide past the grey wire fence. There's a windsock tight above the distant storage tanks and flare stacks. A buzzard stands sentinel on the neatly mown verge, unperturbed by our passing. There are lines of signs, National Grid Transmission System, North Sea Midstream Partners, no photography, visitors report to the gatehouse, but not a soul about in the terminal car park. The Audis and Hyundais are all reversed into their slots. We follow the instructions and come to a halt, back end in. Clearly it's intended that drivers must be able to ensure the fastest getaway in case of an emergency. We sit in the car. Beyond the windscreen, everything is gray. Before us and either side run endless mesh fences 10 feet high, topped with razor wire. They're three feet deep, defenses running in parallel around a massive area that has a footprint equivalent to Stanlow or Carrington oil refineries, which we visited earlier. Between the wire, the ground is white gravel, herbicided to perfection. Irregular intervals, intervals, steel towers stand bristling with CCTV cameras. We've never seen an industrial site that looks quite as much like a rough trade prison. The slush, slush, slush of the gas flare in the wind off the sea is the only thing that gives a sense of what's happening here. The complex is owned by North Sea Midstream Partners. It's the reception place for the Frig A Association, which controls a pipeline that draws gas from the Northern North Sea, including the Norway section. Here too is the landfall for the Shetland Island Regional Gas Export System, Surge, majority owned by NSMP33, bringing in gas from the west of Shetland fields. NSMP also owns the UK Southern North Sea gas pipeline that runs to Teesside. What is this NSMP that seems to have such control over the nation's gas? It's not a household brand name or even familiar to those of us who like to think we know about the industry. We look it up, registered in Jersey, it was sold for 1.3 billion on 24th of September to Ren House Infrastructure the subsidiary of the Kuwait Investment Authority, the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Kuwait. And who sold it to them? Arclight Capital Partners, a private equity firm based in Boston in the US. Clearly the key player in NSMP before the sale was Mike Wagstaff, the man who built the company six years earlier. 
We've never heard of Wagstaff. Google suggests he's a man of that name who now owns a vineyard in Surrey and likes to go sailing in Croatia with his wife and two children. It seems that not just offshore assets, but the apparently unexciting world of onshore pipelines is shifting out of the hands of corporations and into the hands of private equity companies. The industry is being reshaped by a new style of dynamic capital. Just as we get out of the car, a Ministry of Defence police vehicle cruises by and a face in the passenger seat scrutinises. We make for the plant's entrance. The gateway is something like a TV thriller about organised crime. We speak into an intercom, a tiny grill at head height slides back. A section of face is visible. Uh, we'd like to visit the terminal. Not possible. You need to ring Aberdeen 241 300. That's the office of PX Group. End of conversation. We turn back to the car. There's a constant hum of machinery. Herring gulls hang on the breeze. Later, we manage to get hold of Wagstaff and he suggests we come down and meet him at a Guildford station in Surrey. You'll recognise me. I'll be driving a dirty blue Land Cruiser. He pulls up and offers a friendly handshake before taking us to an Italian restaurant where he's on first name terms with the proprietor. We settle down in a quiet room beneath the oak beams. He talks enthusiastically and fluently about his life and work. Men like doing this, but he particularly so. So thank you, that's, uh, that's a sort of little, little slice of the book just to give you an idea of the kind of way we, we approached um, some of the narrative. So, yeah, if um, anyone's got any uh, views or reactions or, or wants to discuss any element of, of oil and um, energy transition and um, social justice, then please, please, uh, I'd be interested to hear from you. I mean, one of the things, as I said at the beginning, we. We don't actually have the answers um, to all this. You know, we recognise it's, it's it's not an easy thing to do to to balance all these things up, and um, it's just a kind of work in progress. But uh, we certainly think it, it it's got to be done. It's got to be a transition, and it can't be one that uh, damages oil workers in the way that the um, rundown of the mines was done in the most disgraceful way. Communities that are still suffering now. 